God bless you, brethren beloved. Uh, good evening and welcome to another uh, in our Bible study series. It's so good to have all of us uh, together joining in, amen, going through the word of the Lord. And indeed, it is a blessed thing for us to take time out and to zoom in and benefit from going through the word of the Lord together. God bless you all, and we are going to get to work and delve right into Bible study. We are on the broad subject of the church, and when we met last week, we took the time to establish a particular foundation to show that the church was not an institution was not a body that just came out of nowhere. It was not an afterthought. It was not something that because things did not go the way that God wanted it, he turned, he tried something and came with a new thing because something else that he was doing failed. Absolutely not. The church was in the thought, in the mind of Almighty God, from the very foundation of the world. And it is very important that we understand that concept. We were a part of a grand plan and design by Almighty God. And so if we can get that picture uh, permanently, indelibly imprinted in our minds, we would start to appreciate some things about the church. It is not a body that is just any and anything. It is something deep. It is something well thought out. It is something strategically planned. It was a critical part of what God was doing to ultimately bring about a certain end that he had in mind for his people and it is very important that we grasp that now to show the importance to show the significance to show the value to show that this is a most holy body that we are a part of we took the time to go back to be the beginning to indicate to us that what you and I are a part of today, what we are in, what we have been baptized into, is something that God had prefigured way back there in the book of Exodus in what was called the tabernacle. When we take the time out, uh, as we are doing now, and we start to delve in and to go through, we are going to see clearer and clearer we are going to see more and more that what we are in today god was showing bits and pieces he was giving hints to the people back there and then that something else was coming they didn't know what it was they had no idea the prophets looked into because they were giving glimpses of what was to come and they wondered about what they saw but they had no idea no concept that such a thing as the church as we know it now would be coming where god would dwell not in tents but in the physical bodies of individuals they don't understand this thing even the angels in heaven above desire to look into this salvation that you and i have so that where we are and what we have become a part of is something that prophets look towards, wondering what it was. It is something that angels desire to know more about. Remember, brothers and sisters, we as humankind were created a little bit lower than the angels. So that the status of angels above is somewhat greater than mankind. And yet, what God has in store for us as humankind, it beats what even the angels could ever imagine to the extent that they desire to look more and want to know more about this thing. What 
is it about man that a great God, the great God, would come down from heaven, veil himself, robe himself in flesh, and die, and then establish a church, and through this vehicle called the church, accomplish his grand plan for humankind. Man, this is massive, this is mighty, this is awesome, and we need to know, understand clearly who we are. We took the time last week, and we kind of a... Uh, uh, started to go into it to show that the tabernacle was more than what met the eye to those that were back there then. As we took the time and we looked, we saw that there are some things that the tabernacle represented. And uh, while we were going through, the time caught upon us. So we are going to go right back to that spot where we wrapped up. And just to review that section and then move right on into um, our study. But bearing in mind that in the tabernacle, there are answers to a lot of the concern that people will have. We used the scripture in Psalm 73 last week. And we realized that Asaph, one of the writers of quite a number of the Psalms, was concerned. He saw that uh, those that did things that opposed God, those that had no desire for the things of God, in their daily walk, they seemed to be flourishing and they seemed to be getting through. And then those who walked with God and lived their lives according to the words of Almighty God somehow did not seem to flourish like those ungodly people. But then as he contemplated it and it troubled him, he became relieved because it is when he went into the sanctuary, when he looked at the sanctuary, then knew he their end so that he was able to see things and to appreciate things and to understand things when he delved into, looked into, went into the sanctuary. Much, brothers and sisters, is revealed to us. So we are going to take some time and we are going to go a bit further in looking into the church that was back there and prefigured by the temple the tabernacle, the sanctuary, and we are going to extract some more. Amen. As we look in the sub-area, the temple, I want to turn our attention to the slide uh, just to rehearse some of the points that we made last week because it is important that we, you know, see the gradual build-up as we get into the tabernacle. This while we will go through this, the tabernacle and study the tabernacle, this entire exercise is not merely to give and to do a study of the tabernacle. In making the connection between the tabernacle and the church, we will have to go through the tabernacle. So we will go through aspects, not an entire uh, study of the tabernacle. And so some things we will leave out for now, some things uh, we will not get into because it is not the tabernacle per se that we are studying. But I want to make the point, I want to establish the link, brothers and sisters, that that tabernacle that first came through Moses in the wilderness has so much to teach us. Much to teach us in terms of discipline, much to teach us in terms of holiness, much to teach us in terms of consistency, much to teach us in terms of our general walk and disposition. As we go through, we will easily see that kind of somber spirit, that kind of approach to everything that had to do with the tabernacle. Different people carried out different functions. And because it was the tabernacle, every man took his particular 
function seriously. We will see it manifesting itself as we go. And if the tabernacle prefigured the church, if the tabernacle was a type of the church, then we can easily understand that if we are in the church, which is the tabernacle today, then the same kind of seriousness, the same kind of solemnness, the same kind of discipline, the same kind of consistency, the same kind of holiness of living is applicable. Contrary to what a lot of people might be out there teaching folks that the church is a place where you just come every man in his own culture, every man in his own order, every man doing his own thing. In contrast to that, it is a place of order. It follows a certain pattern. It is required, and even in the New Testament scripture, it speaks about it, uh, to follow peace with all men and holiness. We find that the common thread goes through scriptures from old to new. The tabernacle that was movable in the wilderness to the permanent temple right down today to the church of Jesus Christ, which is the tabernacle manifested in a totally different way. We will find that some things are common and it is important that we understand that concept. And so we said last week, and I reiterate now, we are really going to go into a study of the church. But we took it from ground zero so that we can understand that this thing came out of something that was already there. And what we are seeing today and the practices today is reflective of what was there years ago. And so having that understanding of what the church is and where everything is coming from, it will kind of guide our minds and focus our hearts so that we realize that this is a real deep thing that we are in. It is not just something to be a part of. It is more than a social gathering, a place where people come sing a song and then meet with their friends afterwards. This is not what the church is about. It is a deep thing. It is firstly spiritual. It then ministers to the whole man after that. But front and center and at the focal point and issue of what the church has to do and is concerned about is the salvation of the souls of men and then having received that salvation to walk as priests, as kings and priests in the sanctuary of the Lord. This church is a sanctuary and we are priests, kings and priests. And so as priests, we do what priests do. Of course, in a different way now because it is a different testament, it is a different era but priests are still here and the fundamental work of a priest does not change and so as we study the church starting from this angle then we are going to later on look at principles in the church and practices in the church and we are going to study those all of this coming under the theme for 2023 earnestly contend so God bless you as we look to the slide right now and do a little bit of um, review and at the same time open up more in terms of some of the things that we had discussed and would have continued on today. Now, we know that the Hebrew sanctuary based on Psalm 73 verse 3 and then verses 12 to 14 and then verse 17, we know that there's so much lessons to be learned from delving into the study of the sanctuary, right? We understand that. And I wanted to just rehearse into our ears the fact that there was about we would say three or four sanctuaries that looking from the beginning in Exodus when that first tent was set up by Moses all the way to the last sanctuary that was standing 
during the time of Herod the Great, when Jesus himself was walking on this earth, there would have been about three sanctuaries. Some say four, but the third and the fourth sanctuary essentially is the same one. It is just that um, King Herod moved to expand and, 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 and beautify the sanctuary that had existed before. But let us take it from the top in terms of the sanctuaries that were there from God started this process. Now God spoke to Moses and he told Moses, look, I want you to go and I want you to build me a sanctuary. And God was very clear and very specific uh, to, in his discussion with Moses and he told him, go in and I'm going to give you the pattern I'm going to give you Exodus 25 and verse 8 spoke to that. Exodus chapter 25 and verse 40 spoke to that. Um, I'm going to require of you to build me this sanctuary. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. I want us to understand, brethren beloved, that it was always the intention of God to dwell among his people. It was his desire, it was his design that even though the heaven of heavens could not contain him, even though the heaven was his throne and the earth was his footstool and he would therefore do his will on earth as he did in heaven, his ultimate aim and desire was that he wanted to dwell among his people. He first had a people that he picked out for himself coming through Abraham and then Isaac and then Jacob and from Jacob the 12 tribes and then all Israel spreading out from there. And God wanted to dwell among them literally, physically. And so he didn't want to just say, I will be your God afar off and when you need me, call on me up in the heavens. No. He wanted to dwell right in the midst of the people. And he was going to do that. And he would have done that through the tabernacle. And he told Moses, I want you to build me a tabernacle that I may dwell in. Now verse 40 of Exodus 25 gives us a little bit more information. Because God is very specific and God, uh, you know is putting his thing together and he's going to do what he said he's going to do and he started to outline to Moses and look that thou make them after their pattern which was showed thee in the mount. So God had called Moses up to the mountain and he showed him the design, the blueprint, the pattern of what the temple was going to be like. And we are going to find out, we are going to, as we go on in a little while, we are going to see that God who knows all things, when he gave them that pattern, that design, he was reflecting some things. And many of us who don't know this evening will be amazed that from as far back there as Moses in the Exodus, as they were going through that wilderness and God gave the instruction to build the tabernacle, we are going to find that God was showing us, giving us an idea that something was coming called the cross. Something was coming called the church. And we will see right in the design, right in the blueprint, uh, an imagery of the cross of Calvary. Folks then would have seen the setup and it would have meant nothing to them then. But as we know at this vantage point that we are at in the church, and as we look back, we are going to see that, my God, look in, right in our very eyes. God had the formation of the cross. God had all the elements that will make up the church in terms of the plan of salvation all laid out in the tabernacle. Brethren, beloved, what you and I are in today is inextricably linked to the tabernacle what was there back there in the wilderness. Make no mistake about it. This is a holy thing. 
This is a powerful thing and we must never lose sight of that. Do not sell. Do not minimize. Do not live in mediocrity. Do not undervalue what we have in this institution that we are in called the church. And then Exodus 36 right through to verse to chapter Exodus chapter 36 right through to chapter 39 gives us the whole construction period and what Moses was doing and he was there putting everything together as I told you we are not going to go into details on a lot of things uh, at some other time we can delve into other areas of the tabernacle but we are going to be focusing on some critical areas to bring out some key points now after the the tabernacle was finished and the tent was erected and everything was in place we notice in exodus chapter 40 and verse 34 that the glory of the lord came down and filled the tabernacle then exodus 40 and verse 34 then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation and the glory of the lord filled the tabernacle right that, that glory there of the lord speaks about his concentrated president um, presence sorry at a particular place we call it the shekinah the shekinah presence the shekinah glory of the lord particular at a particular place it is concentrated there and this glory filled the tabernacle when the saints when the children of israel looked on they saw this magnificent brilliance hovering over that tent and it's moved to the inside and right over the mercy seat you might not know exactly what that is just yet but we are going to look at it but the presence of god was there so god instructed moses to build the tabernacle and then he the lord that having been done everything was in order in the order that god ordained it to be in the order that god pushed it to be and Moses followed the instructions and followed the pattern that God gave him. And God was pleased and his glory filled the sanctuary. So the first sanctuary was that one that was built by Moses in the wilderness. Now, the second sanctuary was a more permanent structure. And it, it is called the temple of solomon of course we know that it wasn't really solomon's temple it was the temple of the lord solomon built it people call it the the temple of solomon but that's a misnomer it's really the temple of almighty god just like on the new testament they speak about the revelation of saint john the divine saint john was not divine and it wasn't the revelation of saint john it was the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave to him. And so we just have to understand that. So I want us to know that although you will hear people around talking about you know, Solomon's temple, it was really the Lord's temple that Solomon built in about 960 BC. Now as we look through 2 Chronicles chapters 3 to 5, that gives us the whole construction period you know, of the temple. It was quite a time in being built and going on the instructions were there it was built with be a beautiful edifice it was built with specific uh lumber and gold in where gold must go and silver where silver must go and brass or bronze where bronze must go and god gave the instructions and it was all beautifully outlined but we notice as we go to second chronicles chapter uh number six um, we find that the same thing that happened uh, earlier, Second Chronicles chapter 6, we see the prior of Solomon having built the tabernacle, having erected the structure. It was a magnificent structure. It was a beautiful edifice and design. And having put everything together, Solomon now started to pray. And Second Chronicles chapter 6, outline this prayer where solomon went to god and started to pour it out and then now that being done we notice and similar to what happened with the first sanctuary solomon having finished prayed and dedicating that 
second temple. This was now a more permanent edifice. The first one was a tent and cloth, and it was movable, transportable. But notice now that this was a more permanent structure. And here we find Solomon in now having finished praying. We see the very same thing that happened with the first sanctuary happening with the second sanctuary. The glory of the Lord. Second Chronicles chapter 7. Second Chronicles chapter 7 verses 1 to 2. Now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the house and the priest could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. It happened again. And so we see that when God is doing his thing and setting up the sanctuary and is pleased with what is there, there is this situation where the glory of the Lord, the Shekinah, the presence of God concentrates itself in a particular way and the glory filled the house. And that is exactly what happened there at the building of the second temple. Now, after this temple was built and time had elapsed, guess what happened? And it is important that we follow what is happening, saints of God. After all of this happened, I want us to realize that there started what was called, what we call apostasy, right? Apostasy. People started to drift. People started to somehow move away from the presence of Almighty God. It happens every time. It happened back there. And who would have imagined that having seen Sites like those where the Lord come down in a powerful and miraculous way. And not only was it known that God was in the place, but people could visibly um, recognize, see the glory of the Lord, a brilliant brightness hovering over the tent. And when the permanent structure went up, that brilliant glory cloud hovering over Solomon's temple. And of course, we are using the term that is normally used, but we know it's the temple of the Lord. That glory cloud hovering over the place, signaling and signifying that God was pleased with what was happening and God was in the temple. And therefore, his desire to be among the people was now realized. In the old the period under Moses, every time that the people moved from one place to another, they carried the tabernacle because it was at the center. I think I said it before, but just in case, and if you didn't catch it, let me just reiterate that point because it is very significant. At the time that Moses had erected that tabernacle, that sanctuary in the wilderness, when the people were on the move, they had to take down the tabernacle and they had to transport it with them. And then when they reached to the location, to the place that they were going, brothers and sisters, they stopped. And then they erected the tabernacle. And then the formation of the tribes was such that they encamped about, round about, that tabernacle so that the tabernacle was at the center of every tribe so for example along the north you had about three tribes along the south you had another set of tribes along the east you had a set of tribes and along the west side you had a set of tribes and they all formed themselves in such a way that that tabernacle was at the mathematical center of the gathering of the 12 tribes of the people of God. It was at the center, very significant. It means that everything that they planned, everywhere that they went, whatever they sought to do, they 
tabernacle, the God that was with them, that was there in the tabernacle, he was at the center. If that is anything to go by, brothers and sisters, we need to learn and to understand he must be today in the church. He must be at the center of whatever it is that we are doing. The body that we have, and we are going to see it shortly, is a temple. And as individuals, we must have the Lord at the center of any and everything that we are doing. Very important point to catch. Don't miss it. And so, this is exactly what transpired there. But then, after a while, that transportable, that movable temple, and there's another point I want to raise before I leave from that and come back to the second temple, which is the temple that Solomon built. In that first temple, notice that God had people doing different tasks. It is in history recorded that to move from place to place, when they were moving from one location and they started their journey to the promised land and they went to another location, in dismantling that tabernacle, there were about 8,000 individuals involved. It was the tribe of Levi that was tasked to deal with the sanctuary matters. And then within the tribe of Levi, there was a subgroup, a family called Koath. And their descendants were the Koathites. And they were the ones that was charged with dealing with the tabernacle and the tabernacle material and carrying the tabernacle. You will recall when the tabernacle had moved to a particular place and then they had taken out the Ark of the Covenant and was going, carrying it back, I believe, into Jerusalem. And they were rejoicing because they had now gotten back the Ark of the Covenant which the Philistines had taken away. And on the way back to Jerusalem, amen, with, this, with that tabernacle, with that, sorry, that Ark of the Covenant, they animal that was carrying it somehow stumbled and in stumbling a particular individual i believe he was user or Uza, he saw the thing stumbling and in order to get it balanced up because nobody would want to see that ark of the covenant on the ground it could not topple it was a holy thing but we have to understand how God works and we have to understand who God is and in as much as it was being carried and it tilted as if it was going to fall the man saw that and he was not of the quartites who were charged with the responsibility to carry the Ark of the Covenant. And he stretched forth his hand to balance and to stabilize the Ark of the Covenant. And right there and dead in, then, in the midst of the celebration, he was smitten dead by Almighty God. And it caused a great fear to fall upon the people to the extent that David didn't even bother make the Ark continue on to the location where it was supposed to go. It was diverted. Fear came upon them all. And brethren, beloved, you might now say, okay, so that is Old Testament stuff. That is the Ark of the Covenant that was in the tabernacle under Moses' time. We need to understand some things. Yes, it was Old Testament, but we need to look, you know, and I'm going to do a study later on on Old Testament and New Testament so that we can get some things clear that, you know, there are things in the Old Testament that were carried over into the New Testament, but it is treated in a different way. It is not two Bibles we have. It is one Bible. And everything from Genesis to Revelation is crucial for the child of God. We understand that some things are no longer done in a particular way. It might be done in a spiritual, a different way. But we need to see it and we need to delve into it so that we know because the very same thing happened in the New Testament church. When the church was formed 
in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, in the early days of the church, God was doing his thing. That spirit of God and the presence of God was there. And God was doing his thing. And did you know that while God was doing his thing and the church, God was adding to the church daily such as should be saved. And they had they were united and they had all things common and everything was happening and they were giving to the work of the ministry. A particular husband and wife came and they gave to the ministry also. But of course, their hearts were not right. Of course, if you're going to give to God, you require it to be done in a certain way, in a particular way. And they deceived the Holy Ghost. They did what was not right in the church, in the tabernacle called the church. And we're going to show that this church uh, is represented in the tabernacle. And right there in the early church, they did something just like Uzzah. He knew he had the information. He's not supposed to even touch it. He's not of the courtites. But nevertheless, he saw something and stepped out outside of his bones and balanced the Ark of the Covenant. And instantly he was struck dead. I remember Ananias and Sapphira. And right in the church, in the heat of everything that was happening, they stretched forth to do something that they had no reason. They, had, they just didn't even have to do it. Whatever their reasons were, whether they wanted to be seen in the gates, whether they wanted to be known as somebody of substance or whatever, I don't know. But they went in and man, the apostle puts them and said, why did you lie to the Holy Ghost? And Ananias and Sapphira, at the end of the day, dropped dead. The same result that came about as a result of Uzzah when he tried to balance up the ark and great fear came upon the people, including King David. The same thing happened in the church when somebody stepped out of bones and boom, Ananias and Sapphira dropped dead. That was New Testament. That was church. That was tabernacle reflecting in the church and they drop dead there and then i want us to understand brothers and sisters and so i just segue into segue into that so that uh, we could have an understanding that look here these things it might seem hard why god was so wicked in the old testament time well Look at what happened to Ananias and Sapphira. Your mind said the same thing. God is wicked in the New Testament too. Brothers and sisters, I say this to us. We need to understand what we are in. It's not a plaything. It is not a dolly house. It is a real thing. Ananias and Sapphira were not in the Old Testament. They were in the church. And we need to not lose sight of that. All right. So... Just to move on now, the first temple was there, the first sanctuary, Moses. It was movable, portable. We finished with that. The second temple was more permanent. It was built by Solomon and the glory came down. Beautiful. But then, having seen all of that, apostasy set in. We can see the glory of God. We can see miracles. We can experience God. We can see things happening. And it means nothing after a while if we are not consistent, if we don't maintain a certain walk, if we don't maintain a certain lifestyle. The same folks that see the glory of God and experience the Shekinah of Almighty God will pull back turn away and cause God to remove himself. And so the apostasy set in, folks who knew what God had done had turned away and God sent, used Nebuchadnezzar to bring judgment upon his people. And so let us just look back at the PowerPoint and we are going to see that... Um, the temple in 586 was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and the people taken back to Babylon as captives, a free people who saw the glory of God 
allow sin to become rampant in their lives, allow things to go haywire, became apostate, and any time that happens, brothers and sisters, you understand it is going to be just a matter of time that something is going to come from God. Yes, instrumental in the background, God is going to orchestrate it, but he is going to deal with us because he does not tolerate sin. And while he will allow things to happen for a while, it is just time before God stepped in. And so the second, when Nebuchadnezzar came, he totally destroyed the first, that temple, sorry, the second temple, that's the temple that Solomon built. Now, of course, they were only going to be in captivity for about 70 years. And after uh, that 70 years had expired, they returned to the land of Israel from Babylon. And while they were there, of course, the work started again to rebuild, to build the third sanctuary. So the first one was with Moses. The second one was with Solomon. And now the third one was now here being built. And of course, Haggai chapter number 2 verses 69 speaks to it in and, and, and compared this sanctuary to the sanctuary that Solomon had built. And oh, it was inferior to the one that was there. And of course, when we read Haggai, we found out that the elders who knew of the first sanctuary, when they saw this third one, and when I say first, I'm talking about the first one, in terms of what Solomon built, when they saw that former temple and now they see this latter one, that they, they cried. It was inferior and nothing to be compared to what Solomon had built. And so we, somewhere we are easily picking up that God always wants a temple to be here. So he started out, not in Genesis, but in Exodus. And coming all the way through, there was always a temple. So after the tent, then Solomon's temple, then after the captivity, another temple was rebuilt, which would have been the third sanctuary. And God always seemed to want to have a sanctuary on earth so that he can be with his people. And that is very, very significant because he said it, I want to be with them. I want to be among them. But then as we go further on, some people call it the fourth sanctuary. Some folks say it's an extension of the third sanctuary. But later down, we hear of Herod's temple. Herod's temple is none other than the temple, the third sanctuary that was left there. And Herod, when he came into power, he moved to remodel and to beautify and to enlarge that's Herod the Great that we read about in the New Testament. And to enlarge the third sanctuary that was there. So the temple that Jesus Christ walked in, the temple that we are reading about in the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, which is any of those Gospels, we realize that it is called Herod's Temple. But it is the same third sanctuary that was built, the one that was inferior to Solomon's Temple. And Herod now moved, and it took Herod 46 years. In fact, I want us to turn to St. John chapter 2 and verse 20. It took Herod 46 years. So you see the extent of the remodeling and the enlargement and the beautification. It took Herod about 46 years. Uh, in John 2 and verse 20, it says this, Then, G then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and will thou rear it up in three days? Of course, we know the background to this, that Jesus told them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. At the time, they did not know Jesus was talking about the temple of his body. They thought he was talking about this magnificent temple that Herod the Great had just set up on over the many, many years. But the point I'm making is that that magnificent temple that was now there, that Jesus walked through and we are reading about in the Gospels, took them 46 years to, it took them that length of time to build it. And it was built. 
So we have now the first temple, or the first sanctuary, built by Moses in the wilderness. Then the second one, which was more permanent, Solomon did that. God is always pushing to have a temple. And after that, Solomon's temple was destroyed. A third sanctuary was built. And then after a while, that one was expanded by Herod the Great. Some people therefore call it the fourth, but it's just an extension of the third. But God always has a temple. Why? Why is it that he somehow seems to constantly be pushing for a temple to be about us? What are some of the things that the tabernacle or the tent represents? I asked that question. What did they symbolize? It must be significant. The fact that God is just always somehow propping the people of Israel to build and to have a temple. And although in this last one, his no Shekinah, notice no Shekinah came down in this one. You, we, you, you, there can be a temple and there be no Shekinah glory. There can be a temple and there be no presence of God. In as much as God wants to be among his people. And from the beginning, whenever the temple came, the Shekinah came down. But here was a point when the temple was there, but there was no Shekinah glory. Even though God said the latter temple shall be more glorious than the former temple. But here the latter temple was and there was no glory there. But we will treat with that at another time. So I'm asking the question again. Are there things that these temples represent? My answer is yes. What did they symbolize? What can we learn from them? And so I want us to take time. I want us to take time and we are going to go through. We are going to go through and see exactly some of the things that the temple symbolizes that the temple represents. Now, brethren beloved, many of us are unaware that in heaven there is a temple setting there. Many of us are unaware that in heaven there is a form of worship. We do know that there are angels there that their only task is to bow before the Lord day and night and do nothing else but cry holy to the Lord. We know that the cherubims and the seraphims, real creatures created by Almighty God, stand before and over the throne of Almighty God and they rest not day and nor night. And they just do the will of Almighty God. Did you know, brethren beloved, that the Bible in the Psalms speaks a whole lot about the temple? Are you aware, brethren beloved, that if we are going to go through the book of Daniel and appreciate a lot of the things, a lot of temple, tabernacle language is written therein? Brethren, beloved, if we are going through the book of Hebrews, we see a lot of tabernacle language there. In fact, in the book of Revelation, and I'm just mentioning this because we're coming back to it. In the book of Revelation, it talks of language, tabernacle language. Fill the book. The high priest, a lamb as it had been slain, the seven candlesticks, the altar of incense, all spoken about in the book of Revelation. Then are these things, because Revelation at this particular point now was talking about what John saw up there. Are these things in heaven? It's clear and it is outlined in scripture. Tabernacle languages are rife throughout the Bible. As I said in Revelation and in Hebrews and in the Psalms, 
Daniel, rife throughout the Bible. We better be careful and take time and understand what we are talking about. And know that the tabernacle experience is inextricably linked to the church experience. Don't undermine or underestimate what you and I are in. Powerful movement. We need to know who we are. We need to know what God we serve and serve him properly. If the Lord is God, serve him and do it with diligence and do it with consistency and do it from the bottom of our hearts. So let us look at what the tabernacle represents. About four critical things, all scripturally backed. And it is important that we see this representation. So let's head back to the screen and look at a couple of things here. So what are some of the things that um, the sanctuary represents? One, or A, the earthly sanctuary gives us a <clears throat> sorry, a powerful representation of the heavenly sanctuary. The earthly sanctuary is a pattern. I have a poem there, but it's a pattern. A scale model of what is actually there in heaven. Now, most folks, as I said, did not and do not understand this basic truth. There is a sanctuary in heaven as we speak. And what is actually happening is that what God gave Moses on earth in terms of the pattern, in terms of the design, is actually what you call a scale model of the real sanctuary of there in the heavens. Very important. He, it, it is God's desire. God wished for us to understand things about the heavenly sanctuary and how it functions, how it operates by looking at the earthly sanctuary. So, brothers and sisters, as we go through and look at what transpired in the sanctuary, we are learning about the workings of the sanctuary in heaven. And it therefore means that if we can appreciate what the priests do here and how the things flowed out and how he had to wash himself and how we had to make sure that he repented by dealing with this burnt offering and how when he went into the particular holy place, he had to carry out some functions. When we see what, all of what is happening here in the earthly sanctuary, we start to get a feel that there is a certain order, there is a certain flow, there is a certain way of approaching the holy place where God is even in the heavens above. And we will see, sometimes we take this thing for granted and don't realize that we have to approach the king. We don't even see him as king. Of course we know that we can make a, a, a an altar anywhere. Of course, we know that we can pray anywhere and God desires that and we do that. But there is a time when we are going to come before the presence of God, He as our King and He as the sovereign God. And we are going to have to come with that respect, with that fear of God, with that knowledge of the fact that this is our King and we therefore enter in at a certain in a certain form and in a certain way. I hear David reflecting it, you know. We need to know that the Psalms are, is, an, is a hymn book for the things that happened in the sanctuary, and I'll show you later on. But I hear David saying, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Now, look at the terms that are used. The gate is the tab tabernacle gate. The court is the outer court and into his course with praise. Brethren, beloved, we need to understand that this is tabernacle language. 
that David in his writing here in the psalm is talking about. And there is that form of entry to come into the presence of the king. And he uses the tabernacle to show us how to come as we come through the tabernacle gate and come into the court, which is the outer court, and how we move on through. And it is teaching us. And all of this is happening, brothers and sisters beloved, in the earthly sanctuary. And he's using it to show us uh, that there is a form, there is a way to enter into so that we can reach that ultimate place which is the holy of holies where the presence of God dwells. Very important concept for us to grasp. Very important concept for us to understand. So the sanctuary, the tabernacle represents, symbolize one, the heavenly sanctuary. Let us read quickly. Hebrews chapter 8 uh, and Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews 8, 1 to 5, just to, you know, just get the feel of what I'm saying. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such, and this is the apostle, you know, writing to the Hebrews, all tabernacle language. We have such an high priest. High priest deals with things in the sanctuary who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. So that high, he's talking about Jesus who is the high priest for us now. And remember, the high priest is the one who carries the blood and makes the sacrifice uh, or presents the blood right there in the Holy of Holies and sprinkle the blood right on that ark box. And he's saying that we have a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne. So he's right in the Holy of Holies on our behalf, right in the throne of the majesty. Where? In the heavens. So the high priest's rule is in the heaven right now. The throne which represents the Ark of the Covenant or the Ark of the Covenant which represents the throne is saying the throne of the majesty. This is where God dwells, the very present the very peculiar direct presence of God is right there in the heavens a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitch and not man so we are seeing here that the writer is talking about a sanctuary not made by man Remember now, all that we have spoken about before is either Moses or Solomon or those who rebuilt the third one or Herod the Great who refurbished the third, which some call the fourth, all made by men. But we are seeing here in Hebrews 2, and so we are telling you that this heavenly sanctuary is what is up in the heavens, nothing to do with the earth. But the earthly sanctuary symbolize or reflects or represents what was in the heaven. So a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. Of course, this is up in heaven. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. You know what a shadow is? A shadow reflects. It's a reflection of a real tangible image. If we have the building that I am in right now, and it is daytime and the sun is on the outside, if the sun is at a particular angle and shines the lights on this building, if we go over to the other side, we see a large shadow of the building. The shadow is not the real thing, but the shadow let us know that there is a real building behind it. 
And so I want us to understand that what we are seeing on earth in terms of the tabernacle, what Moses or Solomon or Herod, any of them built, what we are seeing is really a shadow. It is really reflecting, representing the real tabernacle, which is in heaven. And therefore, what we see happening in the tabernacle on earth, the workmen, the, the gold, the doing the work, offering the sacrifice, bowing down, offering up prayers, all of these things are reflections of what is happening, the real deal in heaven. This is but a shadow. This is but a copy of the real thing in heaven. All right? We won't read the next scripture. I'll just have us to read that later on, but let us go to the next point. So take your time and you're going to go through and you're going to read Hebrew chapter 9, verses 11 and 12. But the point we are making is that the earthly sanctuary, tabernacle, is a representation of the heavenly sanctuary. Secondly, it signifies something more. The sanctuary also is a representation of our bodies, right? Our, what we would call, temple body. It is an illustration of our body temple. It illustrates our body temple and shows what he expects of us. The fact that we, as individuals, are temples. I want us to turn, and I'll just run through this quickly, to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. And we're reading verses 19 and 20. It is important that we see what is happening here. And the scriptures are there to back it up. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple? So we see the term again. Temple, tabernacle, sanctuary, same thing. We are seeing here the Apostle Paul writing, brethren, to the Corinthians and saying, what, you don't know this? You're supposed to know this. But let me tell you, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and you are not your own. So, for you are but with a price, verse 20, therefore glorify God in your body, which is at your temple, and in your spirits, which are God. So I'm just making the point now. He's, he's making the point now to us. Having established that our body is the temple. So it started out as some pieces of material that made up a tent. Then it moved to more permanent structures, wood, covered with gold and other precious stone, precious metals. And then now we see that it represented in one instance things in heaven, which was the real thing. And we therefore realize that the temple and tabernacle or sanctuary on earth was basically a shadow or a representation or a pattern or a blueprint of what really was up in the heavens. So we see that. And then we are now seeing that the tabernacle, the sanctuary, represents our bodies. It is an illustration of our body temple. And the fact that our bodies are temple, our bodies are temples, we need, based on what Paul is saying, hello, Glorify God in your body. Why? Because it is his temple. And guess what? He lives in it. So in the same way that he lived in the tabernacle of Moses and he was concentrated in the holy of holies between the wings of the cherub that was there on the ark of the covenant, and when they moved that box and moved that temple and they went from place to place, God moved and went with them. Brothers and sisters, this body that you and I have is the temple of God today. 
and the Shekinah presence, which is the Holy Ghost, is in the Holy of Holies. Never forget that. Therefore, as priests, we must be very careful how we treat the temple. Back there, they couldn't do certain things in the temple, in the tabernacle. Back there, the tabernacle was a holy place because the presence of God was there. And they were careful that, the, the, you, as we go through, we're going to see some things, you know, they could not allow the light in the tabernacle to, to, to go out. They could not allow the shoe bread to go stale. They could not allow for the table where the incense was offered, that altar of incense, to go without incense going on it and the smoke from that incense going up as a sweet smelling savor in the nose and the nostrils of Almighty God. They could not allow that to go undone so that you just look at what happened in the tabernacle and we see that it was constant service, constant work by the, the priests who you and I are. Don't you know that you're priests, you're kings and priests in this place called the church and in this body temple that we have, that we have just read about in 1 Corinthians, we have to know that the Holy Ghost representing that Shekinah is in us and it is at a place that if we are going to walk and if we are going to move, God is walking with us and God is moving with us and we had better take care of this temple if we desire for God to remain. Remember that third temple. It did not have the Shekinah glory that was there in the temple of, of the tabernacle of Moses. It did not have the Shekinah glory, the Shekinah presence as was there in the tabernacle of Solomon, the temple of Solomon. The Shekinah will leave. The Shekinah will depart. Look at how they treated the tabernacle back there and it will be a lesson to us as to how to treat the temple of our bodies. So we have looked at two things. That the tabernacle in the wilderness, the temple, the sanctuary represents. It represents the heavenly sanctuary. It represents the temple of our bodies. But there is more. Let's look at the third one. The sanctuary also represents and gives lessons about the body temple of Jesus Christ. So we have the body temple, our own body temple, we as individuals, but we learn that it represents the body temple temple of Jesus Christ. Let us look at St. John chapter 2 verses 19 to 21. St. John chapter 2 verses 19 to 21. Let us see if we can bring it up on the screen because I really want us to read it together. Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy this temple and in three days, I will raise it up. Verse 20 and 21. So destroy this temple and in three days, I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, 40 and six years was this temple in building. And wilt thou rear it up in three days? Verse 21, but he spake of the temple of his body. So, brothers and sisters, the tabernacle represents and gives us an indication, a representation. It shows 
and reflects the body temple of Jesus Christ. So we are seeing some things here. And if, if our bodies is a representation of the temple, the body of the Lord Jesus is a representation of the temple. And we know what is supposed to happen in the temple. Then we are being shown what is expected of us in this temple and we are seeing Jesus himself his body was a temple and we easily can see what transpired in the life of Jesus and what was achieved in his body temple important lessons for us brethren beloved now fourthly The temple in the, the tabernacle or the sanctuary back there speaks to and represents the church of Jesus Christ. And I really wanted to come here because this is where we are. We are in the church, that mystical body, that body of called out believers that is here in the 21st century upon this rock i will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it we are here brothers and sisters and the tabernacle the sanctuary that we would have heard about and all that transpired there is reflective of the church of jesus christ i want us to turn to ephesians um, chapter 2, verses 19 um, down. Just a two or so verses. Know therefore, beloved, know therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple, brothers and sisters, in the Lord. It's talking about a building now, you know. And this is the building, the temple being built. But guess what? It is not buildings of stones or wood covered with gold. No, it's not a building like what was there with Moses, which was a tent. It is a building that is being made up of people in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are built together for a habitation of God. Hallelujah. Through the Spirit. What this is saying is that this building is going up right now. It is a holy temple. However, it is not made with stones and wood and anything like that. It is made up of people. In other words, the temple of God today still exists, but it is in the church of Jesus Christ. And all of the wood that was covered in gold and all of the disc that was there that had all of the things was pretty much there or is pretty much there or here today in the person of you and I. The church is the temple. So it is not a disconnected thing. It is not that the church is here. And this is why we have to be very keen and clear and 
why I have a responsibility to let us know that the church is not a dollyhouse plaything. It is not a social club. It is not a place where people come sit down to just get reprieve from certain things and talk about just things that are happening to them. Of course, it is holistic in its offering. But first and foremost, and front and center, and fundamentally, the church is the temple of the living God. And it speaks to the Holy Ghost being in here, which represents the Shekinah presence of God. This is the temple today. And if we just take the time out to recognize that God always wants to be, that was his mantra. I want, he promised it to Abraham. And follow this now. Follow this. He said to Abraham, I want to be with you always. And then he made that promise to Isaac. And he made that promise to Jacob. And even though there was not a standing sanctuary at that time, you know what the patriarchs used to do? In, 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 in trying to have God be with them without the sanctuary being in force and in place as yet. They either made a sacrifice or they used stone and built an altar. And that represented something between them and God and God coming down. You, you remember when Abraham met the angels? And he realized that it was actually God that he was dealing with. And before you know it, he did what he had to do and he go get some stone and he set up an altar. And he built an altar there. And then a similar thing happened to Isaac as he was traveling. And he stopped at a particular place. And when he found that water was there and God was with him, two tools, he ran and he got some stone and he built an altar. And it signaled a relationship with God and man, God being right there with them. And the same thing also happened to Jacob. Jacob was on his way journeying to a particular place and he had to stop because night caught him and he got a stone and used it for his pillow. And then while there he was sleeping and he started to dream and he dreamt that he saw a ladder from earth to heaven and in the dream he saw angels running up and down on the ladder. And when he woke the morning he said, look, God is in this place and I knew it not. God was right there with him. And you know what the first thing he did? Just like all the patriarchs did. Because there were no temple around. He took some stone. The very stone that he had as his pillow. He put it down. And he got some stone. And he anointed it with oil. And he built an altar. And he called the name of that place Bethel. The house of God. There was no sanctuary. There was no tabernacle. God did not come down yet. But that sacrifice. That altar. Until the tabernacle came, which was the house of God, he had something there that he knew that the presence, and all the patriarchs knew that the presence of God dwelt here. But outside of that, the tabernacle came, and from Exodus all the way to today, a tabernacle was always here. The Moses, then Solomon, then Herod, then our bodies, the, the body of Jesus, then our bodies, and of course the church and our bodies are a part of the church. Always a temple. Some things are consistent and some things are common. Other things change. But what we cannot leave without recognizing and realizing is that holiness unto the Lord never changed. Not from the time before the tabernacle when the patriarchs sacrificed and used stones as altars to invoke and keep the presence of God around them. Not when the time when the tabernacle came through Moses, God always had something common. They recognized the holiness of God and they served the Lord and everybody that had to do with that tabernacle with the sanctuary, dealt with it, 
properly. You know how many priests in antiquity were not living right and took up blood sacrifice to go into the presence of God. And when they reach to open the veil and go into the presence of God, God strike them dead. It happened in antiquity. It happened in the New Testament church with Ananias and Sapphira. It happened today. In fact, the Apostle Paul wrote and said, look here, those that are going to take the body and blood of the Lord in communion, be careful. Because for this reason, if you take it unworthily, God strike you with sickness and with death. Why? They all, don't you see common threads, brothers and sisters? So we need to understand that the sanctuary, our body, our, our bodies, the church, all temples, all have Shekinah glory. All require holiness of living. All require consistency and discipline. And if we are in the church and think it's a much lighter matter than what was happening back there in antiquity with the people of God, we make a sad mistake. We leave with that impression to our detriment and to our hurt. And we better understand that. We better understand that. And so having said all of that, I want to introduce us to the tabernacle itself. Just before I get to the slides though, um, as much as I can, I want to pull for us to understand what we are talking about and the depth of it and throw in from different angles, you know, as much information as I can. So that when, once we start with the tabernacle itself, we would have been uh, filled with information to kind of allow our mindset to be adjusted to the reality of what we are speaking about. In the book of St. John, chapter number 1, verse 1 and then verse 14, I want us to read that. It's very important because there is something there that speaks to the sanctuary and most folks don't know and I want I'm pulling from every angle you know because I want us to see the connection with the sanctuary and the church because when we start to get into the church now you know and we say right, this is the church now and we see where it's coming from and we see its interconnectivity with the sanctuary then we know that we're dealing with a holy thing we know and that's why the bible in Jude talks about our most holy faith this faith that we are in is not a dibby dibby joke thing. It's our most holy faith. And I want to ingrain that into our psychology so that we can know that this is. I don't care what nobody else teaches anywhere and to, 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 to dilute and belittle and somehow, you know, make light this whole thing called the church. You have some folks that are not of God. And you have people that to want to make the thing look like it's just a light matter. This is just a place. You just worship. You just lift your hands and that and that. You make these things look like it is so deep. It is a simple thing. Of course, it is simple, but it is deep. Ah, it is holy. This is where the presence of God is. And God not into any messy things. We're talking about God and true holiness and the sovereignty of the Lord. Things are not left up to people, to their whims and fancies. That's why the instruction came to Moses, you know. And it's the same thing throughout the thread of scriptures. Follow the pattern that I have given to you. Let us look at St. John chapter 1, and we start at verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then about, ver it ends with this, no, I think it's about verse 14. Say if we can bring up verse 14. And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory 
the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The literal translation, you know, is very similar to this, but it is rendered a little differently. It's, it's essentially saying the same thing, but given what we have been speaking about, let me read it from a different translation, which is more in keeping with the original form. It says, where we have here, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, the literal translation is rendered, and the word became flesh, and he pitched his tent among us. That's what the literal translation said, you know. So although it is saying the same thing essentially, I want us to understand that it literally used the word, he pitched his tent among us. And in another translation, which is very similar, which is again closer home, it says the word became flesh and he tabernacled among us. Brothers and sisters, when Jesus came, he came. The whole thing has connection to the tent or the tabernacle or the sanctuary. The word became flesh and tabernacled or tented among us. So he knew and we can see this and understand that his body was the body temple. It was a sanctuary. And therefore, the things connected to the sanctuary was going to be fulfilled in him. And it is the same sanctuary that we are talking about. I want us to understand that. Did you know? And I... And I want us to turn to Psalm, and I'm just giving you a few scriptures, and I want us to just see, I'm just pouring them out so that we can see them, so that we can understand that, we can get it clear that this tabernacle thing, this church thing, there is a nexus. There is a, a connection. And I want, by going through all of these things, we see that connection, and we grasp that connection, and we understand that connection very 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 important so psalm 46 and i'll just do a few verse but i'm just trying to make that point psalm 46 and we will read a few verses there god is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble therefore Will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea? I think this is David writing, into the midst of the sea, right? Though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. And then it goes on. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. Go on. The holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. Coming back, you know, we talked about this earlier. She shall not be moved God shall help her and that right early. So hold on, don't, don't go down. let me just put some context to this now. I wonder if we understand that David is, first of all, when it speaks of the midst of the sea, when it speaks of the midst of the sea, seas here is talking about troubles and nations and trouble coming upon Israel, the people of God. And when we look at mountains, it look, they're talking about calamities and calamities coming and falling on us. And uh, generally speaking, when the Bible talks about the ocean and its boisterous movement, it is speaking about calamities coming. So that David talking about the mountains shaking and the sees moving with his boisterousness and all of that he is 
presenting to us a situation of trouble and conflict and all kind of things coming upon the people of God. But then in Jewish history, when it speaks about a river, in contrast to the ocean, the river speaks about calmness and peace and tranquility. So the script, the psalm, what David just wrote here now, he's looking at a situation and he's using these um, different things and poetry to describe wicked, calamitous events coming upon the people. But then he said, with all of the calamity that comes with the mountains moving and shaking and with the sea, with all of the boisterous movements and everything and the enemies coming upon us, signified by the sea and so forth, he said something. He said, God is in the midst of her. I want us to go back to the scripture. Bring up the scripture, um, producer, and let us go again. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her. And that right early. But let's go back to the front. I want to take it from the top again. Having established that the trouble with the mountains shaking and the sea is roaring and the calamity is there and everything that is happening. Look where David turned. Look where the psalmist turned. Look where he says the deliverance is coming from and look under what circumstances, look under what auspices the help is going to come because God sent help from north, south, east and west. But look where God is. He's right in the midst of the people. You remember earlier on we said something about the location of the sanctuary, the location of the tabernacle. It was at the center. All the tribes were around North, south, east, and west, they were around, but the tribe was at the, sorry, the, the temple or the tabernacle or the sanctuary was at the mathematically, mathematical center of the people. It means it was in the midst, in the middle, at the center. So here, the writer of the psalm, and I'm getting ready to, to close, you know. I, I, I'm not going too long this evening, and we're going to pick up after this, but let me finish this particular point, which we'll be finished with quickly. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. So trouble all around is described by the mountains shaking and the seas roaring and all the things happening. Therefore, will not we fear, though the earth be removed, trouble, though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, Trouble will not win fear. Why? Wait, him continue some more. Though the waters roar and be troubled, problem. Though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, trouble from every angle, every side. With all of the trouble, you know, he said he's not going to move. No, he moves to verse 4 and he says something. There is a river. No, as I said a while ago, the river speaks of calm and serenity. You look in Jewish studies, you will find that roaring waters and shaking mountains carried into the sea all speaks of trouble. But talk about the river. It speaks of peace and tranquility. He maketh me to lie down by still waters. River. Still. It's not boisterous like the ocean. A river in Jewish terminology, when they are describing things like these, it speaks of calmness, it speaks of tranquility, it speaks of peaceful repose. And so it says, the, there is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle. So he's come right back to the tabernacle and he's gone into the holy place where prayers go up. So in the midst of the calamity and the trouble, he's in the tabernacle and in the holy place and he's lifting up the incense and offering up prayers and prayers to the most high. And then he goes on to say, God is in the midst. He's front and 
center, at the mathematical center, God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her. And that right early bridge, beloved, I want us to understand that this writing comes out of the fact that the tabernacle of God was dwelling in the midst of Israel. And the God of heaven, who always wanted to be with and among his people, was right there with them in the tabernacle. And the tabernacle was there. God was there with them. At that time, today the same thing obtains. And why can we read the psalm today and have that same peace and calm and confidence in God? Because we, we today are the tabernacle. The tabernacle, the body tabernacle. And we have the holies of holies. And we have the Shekinah in this tabernacle. And so even though the rough waters will sway us, and even though the mountains may shake, and even though the earth may be removed, the tabernacle of God is still with us because here is the tabernacle. Furthermore, with all of the things and the catastrophe around about us, we can still say God is tabernacling with us because the church is here and we are a part of the church and the anointed Shekinah glory is in the church, in the house of the living God, which is the church of Jesus Christ. This is the temple of the living God. And we can read that psalm and we can apply it to ourselves because the tabernacle is still here. Brothers and sisters, brethren, beloved, we need to understand this. So as I close today, I have said all that I have said to bring us to a point where we appreciate the importance of the tabernacle, the sanctuary, where we appreciate that the sanctuary is real and it represents and signifies some things which we have looked at. That being said, we are going to now move into the physical tabernacle and we are going to look at three things that will allow us to appreciate today what is actually happening and how the tabernacle will illustrate and illuminate in a marked and powerful way the church of Jesus Christ and the workings of the church. We are going to look at the plan of the tabernacle and then we are going to close with the pattern of the tabernacle and we are going to see based on the plan and the pattern because we have already looked at the purpose of the tabernacle but we are going to look at the plan and we are going to look at the pattern and we are going to see everything coming together that the pattern has everything to do with what is happening in the church today. The plan of salvation is in the tabernacle. Repentance is in the tabernacle. Baptism is in the tabernacle. The Holy Ghost is in the tabernacle. In fact, so many more things are there in the tabernacle. And we are going to see that the tabernacle is also in scriptures. Right in Revelation, right in Hebrews, right in Daniel, right in the Psalms. And we're going to draw some more. And we are going to allow for us to see the interconnectivity and therefore govern our lives accordingly. When we meet again, brothers and sisters, God's willing, we are jumping into the tabernacle itself. It's planned, how it is laid out, how the different furniture are positioned, the formation, what everything means, the gold, the this, the that. And we are going to see that God had to be a, not a half a worship God. We have to love him because he set up this thing and he hid it from them. And he has revealed it to us and to show us that what you and I are in today called the church. It is coming straight out of the heart of God. It means everything to him. And we 
better fall in line, walk with God, walk good, and allow what is being taught from the tabernacle to attach itself to us so we can appreciate what we have in the church of Jesus Christ. When we get all of this together, then we are going to transition now in the church, which is the tabernacle today, and look at all the different facets. We're going to look at within the church at subject areas that goes far and wide. And for the next 12 months, we are going to be going through some things that are going to keep our minds fixed and focused. And we're going to either take it or leave it. Leave it to your detriment. But God is a good God. God bless you. Thank you for being in Bible study this evening. When we pick up next week, we are going in the tabernacle itself. As I said, the plan, the layout, everything. And step by step, we are going to go through and see the church illuminating in a way that possibly we might not have seen before. God bless you. Let us pray. Father, we bless your great name and we thank you for another evening that you have allowed us to see and you have allowed us to sit together and to hear your word. Bless your words to our hearts and glorify your name. God, you are blessed forevermore. Teach us. Have us to learn. Open our minds and let your word find a place of lodging deep inside so that we can grow therefrom. Bless your name, Lord. We magnify you. We glorify you. We give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise God. God bless you. Thank you for joining in. And as I said, we pick up God's willing next week, same time, as we continue in our Bible study series on the church. And the sub-area for the moment is the tabernacle and how it relates to the church of Jesus Christ. God bless you. See you next week. God's willing. In Jesus' name. Amen.